Hello and welcome to Dove Biology. This is Apes Lessons to Go. Today we'll be looking at resource management and the tragedy of the commons. What is a resource? Well, a resource is anything obtained from the environment to meet our needs and wants. Now there are three basic classes of resources. Perpetual resources, potentially renewable resources, and non-renewable resources. A perpetual resource is something like the sun or wind, which on a t human time scale are continuous and they're not likely to run out anytime soon. Potentially renewable resources are those that on a human time scale can be replenished fairly quickly, between hours to years as long as they're used sustainably. So things like our forests, and our fisheries, the air that we breathe, and the soil that we use to grow our food are able to be replenished. They're renewable as long as we use them in such a way that we give them time to be able to do that. Lastly, but not leastly, we have our non-renewable resources. Non-renewable resources exist in a fixed quantity. We only have a certain amount of them available to us from the earth, and once we've used them up, they're not going to be there for us to use again. Now some non-renewable resources like copper and aluminum and oil to a degree can be recycled or reused in order to extend their supply. Now a country's economic condition will affect its ability to acquire and use those resources. More econom economically developed countries like the United States acquire and use more resources than less economically developed ones. If we look at the pictures uh, that are on this slide, on the left we have a less economically developed country, and on the right we have a more economically developed country. In front of them represents the food that they will consume in a week's time. Notice that the more economic de economically developed country has a lot more available food for them. And the kinds of food are resource intensive, from the plastics and the packaging to the actual food itself. In order to produce meat, for example, it takes a lot of resources. Now a country's economic condition is based on its economic growth. Economic growth is measured in GDP per PPP. GDP is the gross domestic product which is the annual market value of all the goods and services produced in that particular country. And PPP stands for Purchasing Power Parity, which is the amount of goods and services that a person could buy in the United States with local currency. Developed countries have a very high per capita GDP PPP. In other words, um, developed countries, they produce a lot of goods and services, and the individual people have enough currency, enough money, to be able to uh, acquire a lot of goods and services. Now, most of the benefits of economic development are felt in the developed world, including the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, Europe. Now, these nations take up about 20% of the world's population, so a relatively small amount, but they have about 85% of the world's wealth, they use about 88% of its natural resources and produce about 75% of its pollution and waste. As a result, many people in the developed world suffer from this unsustainable addiction to overconsumption and materialism, something oftentimes referred to as affluenza. We can see this affluenza in the commercials that come on our television to what happens when the new iPod comes out every September. Everyone's lining up to get that next latest and greatest, even though they've only had the previous device for one year. That is a symptom of affluenza, that uh, addiction to overconsumption and materialism. When we examine this graphic, we can really see the difference between developed and developing countries. Developed countries have a very small percentage of the world's population yet they use lots of resources and produce lots of waste. And this is primarily due to the fact that they have the greatest affluence. They have the wealth and income to produce the resources and use them, thusly producing much of the world's waste. The connection between population resource use 
and the environment can be summarized by a simple equation. I equals P times A times T, where I is that environmental impact. And it's equal to our population size times our affluence, the how many goods we can consume per person, as well as our T, technology. Uh, the technology that we have in order to produce and consume that given resource. So when we look at a developing country, they may have a growing population, but their overall consumption per person, their affluence is going to be quite low, as well as their technological impact. So their overall impact is going to be determined on their population. So large countries like India and China with a huge population, that's where they're getting their most impact. Whereas in developed countries, our populations are usually much smaller, but our consumption per person, our affluence is great, our technology is great, and those are the two things that are more greatly Im impacting um, our role in the environment. Now, some resources are privately owned. But there are many resources that are shared, like the air that we breathe, the water that we drink and use for sanitation, even the open ocean is a shared resource. When the logic of, if I don't use this resource, someone else will, is applied to common resources, they're oftentimes used unsustainably. In 1968, biologist Garrett Hardin called these results the tragedy of the commons. To better understand the tragedy of the commons, let's take a look at an example where we have several farms that are sharing a common pasture in which to graze their cows. Let's assume a few facts. Here, each cow is producing 20 liters of milk per day. The carrying capacity for this pasture is going to be 8 cows. For each cow, for each cow over 8, the milk production is going to decline by 2 liters. And this is a result of overgrazing. If there's less grass for each cow, then there's going to be less milk produced. So when we start off with our six cows, the total amount of milk being produced in this pasture will be 120 liters. Now, would the farmers sit back and stay at six cows? Unlikely. Not if they wanted to maximize their individual profit, so it's inevitable that at least one of the farms would purchase another cow. This would increase their uh, milk output, allowing for um, more milk for themselves and perhaps milk to sell. This does not necessarily negatively impact the production of the other farmers, um, but they are certainly going to be a little bit envious of this initial farm's uh, new found wealth. So at least another farm would probably get another cow as well. At this point, we're at our maximum carrying capacity of eight cows. At eight cows, we're producing 160 liters. The four farms with one cow haven't seen a reduction in their milk production, but they're certainly not going to be happy that two of their neighbors are making additional profit. So another farm would probably purchase yet another cow. Now at this point we've gone over that maximum amount of cows for our given area. And so if we see now all of the farms have taken a hit and the amount of milk that's being produced per farmer. The initial two farms, which have uh, two cows, and now our third farm with two cows, aren't going to matter so much because they're still producing quite a bit more individually uh, than they started off with. But the three remaining farms with just a single cow have seen a reduction of two liters. And so they're not going to be very happy at all. At nine cows, we're only two liters above um, our maximum yield. So inevitably one of the other farms is going to purchase another cow to try to offset their reduction. This additional cow continues to reduce the amount of cows that each farmer is able, or eat, amount of milk that each farmer is able to produce. Um, the farms that have two cows, they're not overly upset because they're still producing quite a bit more than what they started off with. The remaining farms that only have one cow are getting really upset. So they too would eventually pr purchase an additional cow to try to offset that. With 12 cows in our pasture, we're well below that maximum yield that we were able to get with our uh, eight cows. So perhaps 
the farms farmers would continue to purchase cows to try to maximize the amount that they could produce. This could go on for a while until we have a lot of starving cows. Let's take a look at this graphically so we can see what is happening. When we started off with, we began with our six cows. And we added a few cows and we reached a point where we were at that maximum production for that commons. This is what would be socially optimal for the group. But since we were thinking as individuals, we continued to add new cows. This continual addition of new cows decreased our maximum output. So as a result of that mentality of because if I don't use it, someone else will, we actually had a depletion of those resources and a reduction in what could be produced by that common resource. While the pasture example is a hypothetical one. There are many real life examples of tragedies of the commons. For example, when we look at ocean fishing, the Atlantic bluefin tuna in the late 90s had very, very high numbers. But as a result of unsustainable fishing practices, we've managed to reduce the stocks to very, very low numbers to the point at perhaps they may not recover. So in order to prevent these tragedies of the commons, we need to have solutions. In order to live sustainably, we want to avoid degrading and depleting our common resources. Some possible solutions include cooperative agreements between farmers or fishers. For example, if we go back to our pasture example, if we had indeed purchased those two additional cows and gone up to um, our maximum yield, we could have shared the profits from those two cows evenly amongst everyone. Therefore, all the farmers would have benefited and we would not have depleted the pasture. Another option is government res regulations, laws, uh, local laws, national laws, and international ones. Problems with government regulations are that it does inf infringe on freedoms. Uh, it's difficult to enforce, especially if you don't have uh, enough individuals out there enforcing those laws and it's very hard, hard to enforce international treaties because you've got different governments each having their own set of laws. Another option would be to privatize resources, to build fences because we tend to better protect personal investments but there are some things that we can't privatize like rain or wind or the open ocean. So we really need a set of solutions that are going to work more consistently and so this kind of leaves it up to you how can we prevent tragedies of the commons in the future how can we make sure that we're using our resources in a sustainable way so that those that are potentially renewable are renewed and those that are non-renewable have a long life well into our futures